Hi, Sarah. Hi. Hi, Latifa. Hi. Um, and I think shall we start um, right now? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, today we have Dr. Sarah Stevano uh, from the Economics Department of SOAS. And Sarah is a development and feminist political economist focusing on the political economy of work, well-being, development policy and household. Um, perhaps be before we start, I could frame um, a bit of our discussion today. We'll share a bit of anecdotes and numbers on why I've been looking at um, of feminist economic perspective. Well, globally, um, especially right now, women are facing a high exposure to COVID-19. Um, given the majority of our frontliners in healthcare, social care, um, our extent and other essential services, obviously, women. And a recent report by World um, Budget Group actually highlighted how inadequate personal protective um, equipment are exposing 77% um, of women in healthcare services and 83% of women in social care services are vulnerable to COVID-19 infection. And this is a serious matter, especially when yesterday received a heartbreaking news of a heavily pregnant NHS nurse um, that passed away and um, the baby was saved, but now the baby is without a mother. And the doctors um, and we shared at our um, carers and HS workers, um, our essential frontliners, every Thursday, but we basically are deaf to uh, their needs. And similarly, the movements um, imposed by governments around the world has actually put up more than at home uh, on top of doing work at the office. Um, they also have to take care of family, um, expected to work, and also children um, since now schools are closed. So this is a very um, relevant topic that we'll be discussing today and these are the topics that Sarah will touch upon um, and she'll be speaking about the current pandemic from the feminist economics perspective. But before we begin, just um, a few housekeeping announcements. Um, this session is recorded. Uh, we will have two sessions. The first session, Sarah will be talking for 20 minutes and um, the next session we will answer your questions so please um, do put up your questions in the chat room uh, we'll collate the questions within the first 40, min 40 minutes of this session well i suppose um, that's it thank you again for joining us and um, sarah thank you very much okay so let me just pull this up yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, thank you also to the SOAS Feminist Economics Network. So actually, can you just confirm that you can hear me fine? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, and I also need to thank our, student, our students in the Open Economics Forum because they have been doing incredible work uh, for uh, putting this webinar series together. So I am incredibly grateful. And uh, thank you also to all of you for joining us. It's many of you, and that's great. I hope you're joining us uh, from uh, many parts of the world, though, which is one of uh, the um, uh, one of the positive things like of uh, the current situation uh, to be able to uh, talk like uh, through webinars uh, and so forth. Uh, so like I hope we can do more of this like also when the crisis is over. Um, but let me get into the feminist economics of COVID-19 so that we have uh, hopefully more time for questions at the end. Uh, and I would like to start uh, with uh, a basic question. So what does it mean to take a feminist economic perspective to the current pandemic? And so to me, this means analyzing how both the public health crisis and the economic crisis have differentiated impacts and how existing and new forms of gender oppression might be strengthened or produced under the current circumstances. Crucially, though, I think it is not possible to fully understand the gender inequalities uh, unless we examine how they intersect and articulate uh, with other forms of class and race inequality. And I think this, this needs to be at the core of feminist analysis uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, 
Um, so to have uh, uh, a take uh, on uh, the multiplicity of uh, inequalities, uh, I think we're better equipped with a social reproduction lens. So just to be clear, what is a social reproduction? Social reproduction is a broad notion um, that uh, refers to the totality of everyday practices uh, and uh, more structured uh, uh, long-term processes uh, that are needed for the reproduction of human life uh, and for the reproduction of the workforce as well. So these include uh, uh, the unpaid work that often takes place uh, in the household uh, such as buying food, cooking, cleaning, uh, caring, and so forth, but also the forms of uh, paid uh, and wage work uh, that are entailed uh, in the provision of uh, health care, of education, social services, and infrastructure at the societal level. So to take a social reproduction perspective means uh, taking a step back and focus on what is necessary for workers uh, to be able to wake up every morning and go to work, and for production at large to take place uh, on a daily basis. Um, so, of course, a lot has been written already on COVID-19, not least from a feminist perspective. Um, so, for example, some weeks ago, I read uh, a piece in The Atlantic by Helen Lewis uh, entitled The Coronavirus uh, is a Disaster for Feminism. Um, which provides a sobering picture of the exacerbation of all existing uh, gender inequalities uh, that we are starting to see and we should expect to see more uh, in the coming weeks and months. And of course, uh, this is very critical and uh, we will look at some of these inequalities uh, uh, later on. And of course, uh, Latifa started this conversation by mentioning some anecdotal evidence on this. However, I also think that we need to remember how every crisis provides an opportunity for change and I think uh, this crisis is rather unique in that it has suddenly put the brightest spotlight on forms of essential work that capitalism has long sought to make uh, invisible and devalue. So to use the words of uh, Titi Bhattacharya who's a theorist of social reproduction, this crisis has temporarily forced capitalism to prioritize life making over profit making. So I think our task uh, as feminists uh, is to make sure that the centrality of life uh, is the pillar on which we're going to build uh, what will come after this crisis. Uh, so let me move on to the four questions that I was given, which take us on a little journey from how the situation was before the crisis, uh, what has changed, uh, what the likely outcomes are, and what can be done. And I will structure my reflections on uh, two themes that are central in, fe in feminist thinking, household and work. And I will try to highlight uh, some of uh, uh, the interconnections uh, between households and work. So what was the situation prior to the pandemic? Well, it is clear that uh, there were already many dimensions uh, of the organization of economies and life uh, that required change uh, from a feminist perspective. Um, so many feminists, and I think uh, most notably Nancy Fraser, have been talking about a crisis of care brought about uh, by the intrinsic contradictions uh, of a capitalist system that needs a social reproduction, but essentially does not want to pay for it. Um, and I think this can be seen very clearly through a focus on households, uh, because households have become increasingly responsible for the provision of welfare. So this is a process that has been called the privatization of welfare provisioning or the privatization of social reproduction that unfolded uh, during uh, uh, the neoliberal era. So the rolling back of the state, which was uh, deliberately promoted uh, uh, by local politicians in the UK and the US uh, started, uh, started in the 1980s uh, and uh, imposed on uh, uh, in many countries in the global south uh, with the structural adjustment programs at the same time, um, has shifted the burden of welfare provisioning from the state uh, onto households. And so, of course, uh, the impacts, uh, the effects on households uh, were differentiated uh, because uh, the wealthier households uh, were able to outsource care provisioning um, and domestic work through hiring nannies and domestic workers uh, and uh, often uh, these workers uh, are migrant women. 
And on the other hand, the majority of poorer households uh, had to absorb uh, these overgrown responsibilities uh, by extending their working day, by taking up a variety of uh, poorly paid and insecure jobs, uh, and essentially trying to juggle um, more domestic work and paid work at the same time. And this bears a significant gender implications so because we know very well that women and often also children are overwhelmingly responsible for domestic work. So alongside this, uh, and I don't have really much time to uh, go into this uh, but, uh, uh, in detail, but I need to mention the importance also of looking at uh, uh, the, the process of financialization and how financialization has led to uh, an increase in household debt, um, uh, which is extremely high at the moment in uh, many countries. Uh, um, and uh, uh, through financialization, uh, households have also been uh, further integrated uh, into financial systems. So in contexts and in countries uh, that where financialization is more advanced, uh, we have households uh, that not only are privately responsible for their welfare, but they're also overburdened with debt, uh, and debt also serves uh, like a debt scope in many cases, uh, and overexposed uh, to financial risk. So you can see how households are not in the best place uh, to take up the additional work and the additional responsibility to respond to this crisis. So, so we can keep this in mind like uh, for later. Um, but in a way, and I will explain this later better, households are central in the response to this crisis so far. And feminist economics has a vantage point on the household because unlike other branches of economics, it has spent a great deal of time studying households. So for example, facts have shown that if we look at households from the inside, then we see that households are places where gender inequalities are reproduced. And if we consider households through their external relations, so we see that the work that takes place behind the walls of the household, uh, although it has been constantly made invisible, it has been devalued and depoliticized, this work is absolutely vital for the survival and the maintenance of our economies and societies. So these broad changes at the household level cannot be understood unless we see the interconnections between production and reproduction. And this means looking also at what happened in the labor markets. So with the retreat of the state and the unfolding of globalization, there have been transformations in the labor markets uh, that led to the rise of precarious, uh, informal, casualized work. So it is now clear that some of uh, uh, the gains uh, that were made by workers uh, in some contexts in the global north in terms of workers' rights uh, and job security in uh, two decades, the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, were not a step in a long-term trajectory in that direction, but they were actually an exception to a global tendency to produce a further deterioration in working conditions across the world. So to put it in the words used by Bremen and Van der Linden, in terms of the informalization of work, it is clear that it is now the West following the rest and not the other way around. So here, I think we need to take a global perspective and focus on uh, the restructuring of global production that created a global division of labor that is gendered and racialized. And so with uh, the relocation of manufacturing to the global south, um, many jobs, so particularly for working class uh, uh, men, were lost in the global north. And although new jobs were indeed created in the global south, these jobs were premised upon the availability of cheap labor and uh, the employer's ability to uh, maximize uh, their profits uh, in this way in the context of intensifying global competition. So the organization of global production in global value chains uh, has consolidated and worsened uh, forms of unequal exchange uh, between uh, the global south uh, and the global north, uh, where workers at the bottom and at the margins uh, of uh, global value chains in the global south work in conditions of poverty. And these are workers uh, from uh, almost always uh, from poor backgrounds. Uh, they're often women and migrants. Uh, 
And so labor markets are vehicles for the reproduction of inequalities. Uh, and this is captured by the conceptualization or the theorization of labor markets as gendered institutions uh, by Diane Ellen in the 1990s. What does it mean? It means that the disadvantage of women face in various domains of life are carried into the labor market uh, and therefore women enter uh, the labor force uh, but they are exposed uh, to super exploitation um, and of course i think like that this goes beyond like a purely gender dimension like and it has to do like uh, with uh, different groups of work uh, that uh, uh, suffer from uh, discrimination and forms of oppression in various domains of life so this indeed underpins the creation of segments of the labor market that offer bad jobs, workers that are considered to be unskilled or low skilled, keep that in mind because we'll come back to this classification later. And we see a clustering of, a clustering of women or workers from poor backgrounds and from BAME backgrounds in these low skilled and unskilled jobs. And so this can be seen very clearly, for example, in the paid care sector, so healthcare, education, domestic work, which is highly feminized, low paid and devalued. And it shows how the devaluation of work by women, by BAME people, by migrants, goes beyond um, uh, the work in the household. Um, so moving now to, to think about how, um, uh, what changed in these first few weeks and months now with the COVID-19 outbreak? What is the situation now? So it is clear that COVID-19 comes into play in an already critical situation in terms of inequalities and the squeeze on social reproduction. Um, and I think two important things have happened that can be best understood from a feminist viewpoint. The first is the intensification of work that takes place in the household. And the second is the discovery for society at large, beyond the feminist circles in a way, of the centrality of care and social reproduction. So here something interesting is happening because on the one hand, those who continue to work are of course exposed to serious health risks, but on the other hand, these workers uh, had to be recognized uh, as essential. And so this, for example, forced uh, the UK government uh, to rebrand uh, these workers uh, as the key workers, uh, while uh, up to a few weeks ago, these was, were considered to be low skilled and unskilled workers. And I think uh, this is very important uh, for, for our perspective. And so this is a crisis so that I think is different from previous economic crises because it takes a foundational element of our economies and societies, which is the organization of work. And to understand how this is being shaken, we need to consider the interplay between productive and reproductive work. And this is where I think feminist economists and political economists have an advantage. So what can be seen at the level of households is that, of course, the stay-at-home policy means very different things to different people. And the spectrum is very wide. It goes from those who do not have a home, those who cannot afford to stay at home because they rely on daily earnings, uh, to those at the other end of the spectrum who have comfortable homes uh, with outdoor spaces and perhaps also living domestic workers. So disease itself, but also some of uh, the responses to the COVID-19, so the school closures, so the disruption in the provision of care in care homes and informal care networks uh, have already intensified uh, very significantly family responsibilities. Uh, and depending on the type of household we live in, of course, we experience a different patterns of intensification of domestic work and care. So the closure of schools means that the differences between those with and without children are clearly heightened. And in general, those with caring responsibilities will experience a greater burden. So lone parent households are particularly exposed in this. And in general, so household composition is very central. So we need to look at what the household leave, uh, what the household is, and who lives like in a household. So their age, their health status, and the occupation they have, 
shape each of them has actually shaped the household's health and economic risk with implications for public health and the economy at the societal level. And of course, those who continue to work, the key workers, are facing much bigger challenges in terms of health risk for both themselves and the people they live with. But also, um, there's a greater challenges in the provision of care for their families uh, and in daily practices uh, such as their ability to acquire uh, food. So the conditions of key workers make it clearer than ever that we cannot understand what happens in employment as detached from social reproduction. The starting point is to, at the minimum, appreciate how these workers live in households that will shape their ability to go to work and their additional burdens in terms of care, domestic work and also health risks. So in those countries where governments have put in place the mechanisms for support, these tend to be for workers, while unpaid carers and unpaid care and domestic work in general falls outside of these visions. And uh, I think this is a key limitation that we need to focus on. And it is evident uh, that uh, both uh, the disease itself and the government responses are deepening that process of uh, privatization of social reproduction at the level of the household uh, that I talked about uh, at the beginning. Now, in terms of the organization of work, um, multiple forms of inequality interact to shape the differentiated impacts of the current crisis. So here I'm going to say a few words uh, on the UK, drawing on some data that I was able to put together. And, uh, um, and then I'm going to say a few words about two categories of workers uh, in the Global South. So for the UK, uh, the Women's Budget Group, uh, has documented that 77% of healthcare workers uh, are women. And uh, the think tank uh, Autonomy has created a jobs at risk index uh, to assess uh, which workers are more at risk in terms of exposure to the disease and physical proximity to others. And their findings uh, show that uh, the vast majority of high risk uh, occupations uh, are classified as key workers. Uh, Again, 77% of the high-risk workforce are women, and 98% of high-risk workers in low-paid jobs are women, which I think is really uh, staggering. And unfortunately, we don't have like, the same level of uh, detail for uh, BAME workers and for migrant workers, but for example, the Institute of Race Relations uh, um, reports uh, that many migrant workers uh, are essential workers, uh, so they're continuing to work in this moment. Uh, and uh, this needs to be highlighted, how none of uh, these workers would be eligible to remain in the UK under the new uh, government's immigration policy, which defines uh, those earning under £25,000 a year as low, as low skilled and essentially unwanted in the UK. So early figures so from the UK, but also from the US, so show that the BAME people are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And uh, of course, uh, like, uh, this is an issue of uh, racism and not of race. And the British Medical Association states that this could be the result of existing health and social inequalities uh, in effective government and public health communication to BAME communities. Uh, and also higher rates of underlying health conditions uh, among uh, some BAME groups. So the crisis, I think, is really showing how the underpinning socioeconomic inequalities uh, um, place specific social groups in a position of compounded risk to their occupational status, uh, the lack of safety at work, uh, their living conditions, uh, and also their health. In the Global South, um, and again, it would be uh, uh, very useful to have uh, more data on uh, workers in the Global South, um, but uh, uh, what we certainly know is that the two groups of workers uh, um, are uh, going to face, uh, are probably already facing a very tough reality, and these are the global supply chain workers. Uh, 
and the informal workers. And at times, uh, of course, a worker can be both an informal worker and a global supply chain worker. So we know that global su supply chains uh, have been severely disrupted. So UNCTAD, for example, states that so far the pandemic had a cost of $15 billion in lost exports. And this was a few days ago, like, so this is only increasing by the day. And so like, I had a look at uh, um, uh, the garment sector, for example, uh, that is a sector where retailers are cancelling orders and backing out of previously placed orders. Uh, and so like uh, this has meant uh, incredible losses, uh, uh, estimated uh, um, uh, uh, in the terms of uh, $3 billion uh, for in, in terms of cancellations that have already taken place in uh, Bangladesh, for example, which is, of course, a country that uh, is uh, a primary exporter of uh, uh, garments. Uh, and so this means that uh, the workers uh, in uh, these factories, uh, but also the home-based workers uh, that contribute to the supply of garments, uh, are uh, uh, have already lost their jobs or are losing their jobs uh, and incomes. Uh, and we know like, from the research that has been conducted, for example, on the garment sector, but our supply chains, so that uh, these workers at the bottom of uh, global supply uh, uh, chains uh, are um, often women. Um, and the millions of informal workers uh, who constitute 90% uh, of all workers in the global south are both exposed to health risk uh, and poverty. So some governments uh, do not even recognize these workers as workers, uh, but actually many of them are essential workers. So, so some of them are waste pickers, uh, for example, and continue to work uh, with no protection. And so again, for the work that uh, uh, various people have been doing to shed light on the reality of the informal economy in the global south, and for this I would recommend looking at the work by Vigo, for example, um, we know that women are overrepresented among the, uh, the first types of informal jobs. And so I think this is something that we uh, really need to pay attention to. So it is clear that the outcomes that we should expect, including those that we can already see, are dire. And the profound class, gender, and race inequalities that mark our socioeconomic systems are being exposed and uh, aggravated and exacerbated before our eyes. I think we also need to pay attention to the many, uh, if you want, indirect impacts that they will also emerge. So we know, for example, that during the Ebola outbreak, uh, resources for reproductive health were diverted to the emergency response, uh, and this contributed to a rise in maternal mortality. So in the UK, already some weeks ago, the Guardian was reporting that the shortage of midwives has doubled, uh, owing to the diversion of staff uh, to the COVID-19 response. So we need to keep an eye out for this. And of course, uh, something that is uh, incredibly worrying, although probably not surprising, is uh, the surging domestic violence uh, that uh, really shows uh, how households uh, can be places of harm for many. And uh, this is something that uh, needs to be um, uh, borne in mind uh, and uh, uh, something that requires action. I can see that now you can see on the screen uh, um, a slide where you can see a list of resources, some of which I've mentioned in my talk so far. Um, but so like this, of course, we need to think about all of these inequalities that I have been talking about. But I think that there is an opportunity in the realization that something needs to change radically. So we can no longer afford to have societies organized on precarious labor, where families fall into destitution as soon as they are not able to work. Uh, societies that are founded on the devaluation of essential work and on the prioritization of profit over life. So I'm going to conclude by mentioning four things that I think can be done. And I think that the responses um, uh, to this, so the general principle is that this crisis is different from previous ones. And therefore, what is needed is also different. Um, so it is clear that uh, as much as uh, households are central, 
uh, I think they need to be supported for that, but they cannot and should not do everything. They should not take the burden of social reproduction early. And so we need forms of community support, uh, mutual aid groups and community organizing to share care and all forms of social reproduction to begin a process of uh, socialization of uh, social reproduction and care. Um, I think we need a form of uh, uh, income guarantee or uh, uh, income replacement, a universal basic income for all, including migrants and refugees, and we need this now. And uh, we need to begin to work towards uh, a system of universal basic services uh, with a, a priority for universal care in those countries uh, uh, that don't have it uh, yet. Um, then further, we need to permanently adopt uh, the key worker or essential worker uh, classification. And this is not only a language issue. I think uh, this needs to entail better pay and better higher social status uh, for all of these workers, uh, including for the workers uh, in uh, uh, this category who are migrants. Uh, they need to be recognized uh, indefinite, indefinitely to remain. Um, and fourth, I am, I am very worried about the nationalist responses that we have seen so far. And I think we need uh, an internationalist stance uh, in order to contrast uh, these nationalisms uh, that are emerging in different uh, places of the world. So we need activists in trade unions, uh, feminists and environmental groups, uh, farmers organizations and pro-migration groups to come together to work uh, towards uh, forms uh, of international solidarity. So I think uh, this is a time when uh, feminist economists and political economists uh, have valuable things to offer. Um, and uh, this is a serious responsibility that uh, we should take up. Um, so this is what I had to say. And I think I'm going to leave it there. And I look forward to listening to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, maybe while we give some time for people to put up their question, um, I do have one question and, and, and I would like to pick mm -hmm. up on your point um, where you mentioned something about rebranding, like the UK government rebrand the workers and looking at low skill um, and unskilled workers. Do you think that, that should, there should be a clear and perhaps internationally accepted definition of essential workers? Because um, right now mm. we can see that different government actually define essential workers differently. In some countries, people who work in wet markets are deemed essentials and other don'ts. And you know, in, in domestic workers are essential in one country and not in another. So you know, having a variation of definition may risk some group to fall into the cracks. Do you think that there should be you know, uh, an accepted definition of what essential is? Yes, thank you so much for the question, Latifa. Um, I think uh, uh, I think there will be differences across contexts, so we should uh, we should not downplay those differences. So, but I think that uh, some broad definition of what constitutes uh, essential work uh, is entirely possible, and it has to do like uh, with uh, recognizing those forms of work that uh, um, contribute towards uh, social reproduction. And I think that in this sense, uh, um, you know, like it has to do like uh, with care, of course. So, like, so we are looking at healthcare, at education, uh, like in a number of uh, like uh, social services. Uh, but also, like, it, like I'm, I'm thinking a lot about uh, the food chain workers uh, and uh, and uh, the people who work in transport, for example. And I think uh, that uh, it it is entirely possible to come up with uh, a definition of essential work that can be applied uh, um, globally. Um, and uh, the primary aim is, uh, you know, like not necessarily you know, to uh, have like workers, like uh, some workers in some contexts uh, falling through the cracks, but like uh, to highlight uh, the centrality of social reproduction in uh, the world that we live in, essentially. And uh, the one thing that uh, these uh, key workers uh, and essential workers have in common is that uh, um, they have been uh, considered low skilled for a very long time up to very recently. And so 
we cannot afford like to go back to a situation in which once the crisis is over like uh, these workers will go back to be low skilled workers i think uh, we should abandon like uh, that uh, unskilled uh, low skilled classification uh, for good okay yeah. thank you sarah um, we have one question from Isabel. Um, I think this mm -hmm. is in relation to the, um, you mentioned about what countries could do. Um, high level of debt that countries have right now. Um, she's asking, how do you think that the universal services as a healthcare system um, and how sovereign debt is actually going to increase uh, because of this crisis? Mm -hmm. So, like the question is about debt at the country level, not household debt necessarily. Oh, sovereign debt, yeah. This is sovereign debt. Yes. Question yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So, I think, uh, so look, like uh, the type of measures uh, that I talked about, like I wanted to highlight uh, these measures so because I think that this would be very unique in uh, the current situation. Uh, given uh, the um, the fact that this crisis is different from others uh, for the reasons that I described before. Um, but of course, I think that uh, we need to um, uh, we need to have a combination of responses. Uh, and so like of course, uh, uh, sovereign debt is an important issue. and I think that uh, uh, the call for debt cancellation for countries in the global south is a very important one and we will have a, a webinar with uh, Cristina Lascaridis uh, on this topic. Um, and uh, of course, like, uh, these uh, are um, uh, measures uh, that uh, need to be put in place in order to create a space uh, for particularly for the poorer countries uh, to uh, uh, to spend uh, like and to put in place uh, uh, resources and systems to uh, take care of uh, uh, the populations like and to reward the, uh, and to sustain a social reproduction. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. Um, the next questions that we have um, is from. Sandra, um, she's asking about the universal basic income. Um, mm -hmm. She's asking your views on some um, feminists that claim universal basic income could trap women further into unpaid care roles. Um, mm -hmm. And your views on this. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the question, uh, which I think is a very important one. So I. I would not have advocated for a universal basic income up to recently, I think. Um, and the reason is that I think that a system of universal basic services uh, is uh, uh, probably more uh, useful and appropriate uh, to make sure like, uh, that people have access uh, to what they need instead of assuming that uh, by giving people money, like uh, they will be able to uh, provide for their welfare, essentially. Um, but I do think that uh, in, uh, uh, in this context of crisis, uh, uh, universal basic income uh, would, be, um, would be needed. Um, and this is you know, to make sure that families uh, don't have to worry about uh, having money to acquire food and so forth. Uh, but I, um, I don't think that a universal basic income has the potential to address uh, gender inequality uh, per se. And for this, like, I, I've read recently a very nice a short article by my colleague and friend, Lorena Lombardozzi, who was listed uh, like in uh, those uh, resources on that slide, uh, which maybe we can put up again later, um, that makes it this argument uh, that uh, uh, the, the universal basic income might be needed in this situation of crisis, so that is not a uh, uh, panacea or is not a past effective tool to address uh, gender inequalities. Uh, and this is why I would stress uh, that uh, um, we need uh, income replacement, we need uh, like a, perhaps a UBI like in some contexts, uh, but uh, um, it needs to be uh, combined uh, with a medium to longer term strategy on uh, developing uh, uh, universal basic services. We have, we have quite a few questions actually coming in. Okay. Um, the next one, I think, um, <clears throat> this is um, slightly interesting and controversial, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's asking um, 
you know, which feminist perspectives has impact on economic decision making, whether there's an example of a country that has uses feminist perspective um, in its policy, economic decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the interesting question. Yes. So, look, there are uh, many different uh, 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 feminist uh, economic perspectives. So, so we need to recognize uh, this plurality, okay? Um, and as a matter of fact, in the past few decades, uh, uh, there has been an uptake of uh, the importance of uh, gender and gender inequality in relation to the functioning of the economy that uh, some governments uh, have paid attention to, and this is reflected in policies. Uh, so, for example, I'm thinking about uh, Canada, which is uh, uh, probably the latest country to adopt uh, a type of international assistance uh, policy um, de explicitly defined uh, as uh, feminist. And, uh, and I think that uh, before Canada, um, uh, Sweden uh, had used a similar type of approach to um, uh, essentially to aid like into development issues. What this means in practice, and I had a student uh, um, in uh, uh, the university where I was working previously who did uh, his dissertation on this, it was very interesting. But for example, the Canada policy in this uh, means uh, um, essentially um, uh, directing or channeling, channeling resources to types of development projects uh, that target women but that have a gender component. Um, and I think you know, like, uh, this is debatable whether we can uh, you know, achieve uh, uh, development goals like and poverty alleviation goals like uh, by targeting women. And I think uh, many feminists, including myself, uh, are quite uh, um, uh, doubtful that uh, this is always the case. Um, but I think what we need in terms of uh, having uh, uh, governments that take uh, a feminist economic perspective uh, is uh, particularly around uh, um, uh, valuing uh, care work and all forms of uh, uh, social reproduction work that currently are devalued and in some cases are not even considered to be work. And I think this is something that uh, still requires a lot of work uh, on our side in order to get there. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm going to address um, one question here and perhaps yeah. before doing that, um, this is one question from Ibrahim. He, he wanted you to explain a bit more on socialization of action. And there's another question from Graziel on intensification um, of work in household and gender. Um, given the different mm. impact on COVID-19, um, more info on this from your side. Um, she's requesting for that. But I just want to highlight to Graziella that um, towards the end of this session, um, we'll put up again the sources of um, resources that um, Sarah has shared. So there will be a lot of information in terms of where you can go to find information, um, links to reports that will have a lot of information and data. Um, so we'll put it up towards the end of the session um, for about five minutes so everybody can look at it. But, um, you know, if you want to answer those two socialization of yeah. questions, and, you know, more information on the uh, household and, and the different yeah. impact. Yeah, sure. So on uh, socialization, I think this is something that is very important to me because uh, I think that uh, while on the one hand uh, there is a pressure to say, well, you know, uh, households and families like uh, have uh, uh, a lot that they need to take on. And so like uh, what we need to do is uh, to support the uh, households and families uh, rather than uh, for example, big businesses, so, which is, of course, like I totally agree like, uh, that this should happen. But I think what is very, very uh, critical for me is to recognize that uh, really households cannot uh, take uh, uh, 
all of they cannot take all of the responsibilities uh, for care and social reproduction and they should not do that so uh, and i think you know the surge in uh, domestic violence cases uh, like highlights uh, that households uh, can be a site of harm uh, for for many people like and for many vulnerable people especially so i think that uh, we need to we need to think about ways in which uh, care and social reproduction can be collectivized and socialized. Uh, and that means uh, having a public provisioning of uh, particular care services, uh, for example. But also, I think it is uh, uh, fundamental to, um, uh, to promote like, and to participate like, in those uh, grassroots uh, like, and community level organizing around, uh, for example, food provisioning like, and uh, 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 forms of care that uh, entail the participation of uh, community members and neighbors and so forth. Uh, um, because I think like, uh, this, is, uh, this has got a very important uh, uh, transformative potential and it can act uh, as uh, an equalizer. Um, in uh, uh, really uh, putting forward a more radical redistribution of uh, care and social reproduction in society. Um, so that is uh, uh, quite critical for me. Um, and uh, uh, you're welcome, Ibrahim. Uh, and then in terms of uh, intensification of uh, uh, domestic work at the level of the household, so I think uh, we need to, so here, like uh, my reasoning was more like in terms of, uh, in conceptual terms, if you want, like and uh, anecdotal, like uh, piecing together information that I have been reading in newspapers and so forth. Uh, um, I think uh, I mean, it is uh, very clear that uh, with the disease itself, uh, we have uh, an increase uh, in uh, care needs uh, for the elderly and the sick. Um, but also with uh, the closure of schools, uh, it is clear that uh, people who are living at home with children um, have seen uh, their responsibilities for childcare uh, increase uh, significantly over the past few weeks. Uh, and uh, I think that this is an area on which like, we need to um, uh, we need to analyze uh, further. And uh, actually, we haven't seen. Uh, um, uh, data so far that uh, captures uh, like uh, the extent to which uh, this the process of intensification has taken place, uh, but it is very clear that it's taken place, uh, and uh, like uh, the people who are expected to continue to work from home, like uh, while having to uh, take care like of the children, homeschooling, and uh, uh, caring for them. Um, are of course, I mean, this is you know like a rather impossible or very difficult task like a, for for many. Um, uh, so so I think like a, this and I, sorry, like I also wanted to mention that uh, something that uh, is probably happening for some households and some uh, families uh, is that there are changes. Uh, in uh, um, the distribution of uh, and the allocation of work and responsibilities within the household. So there are those uh, within household uh, dynamics uh, uh, that feminist economists have been uh, uh, looking at for a long time that uh, also will uh, need to be explored. So in a conversation I was having some time ago with my colleague, so as, uh, Hannah Bargawi, who's also a feminist economist, uh, she was uh, making an important point thinking about how gender roles uh, might change in the household and how like, some men may take up more responsibilities for unpaid care and domestic work in the context in which uh, like, uh, does the volume of that work has uh, intensified. And I think this is possible. Like, uh, the key question is like, to see like, uh, which households uh, um, are affected in what ways. Um, and whether like uh, some of these changes, so where they there where these changes have moved like say, in a positive direction in terms of uh, gender distribution of work, or whether these uh, are sustainable or not, like or whether these changes uh, will be overturned like uh, once the crisis is over or not. So yeah. The next <clears throat> excuse me, the next question is from Gus. Um, it's about the 
current neoliberal governments that we have and whether you know using universal basic income or universal basic services would further exacerbate um you know the value or devalue the work of women in the global um south in the global south well uh, okay. well basically globally because you put global south and north so globally yeah uh -huh. okay um, so whether universal basic income can uh, devalue the work uh, of uh, women uh, globally. So I think yeah, like, I would probably go back to something that I said before, like uh, that I uh, I haven't been like a big, a very big advocate of universal basic income, but I think uh, in uh, the current crisis with like many people like losing their jobs, losing their incomes uh, and uh, really um, uh, facing uh, uh, conditions of poverty and destitution. I think that uh, um, uh, governments uh, need to do all they can in order to uh, uh, support people and uh, uh, avoid uh, these uh, uh, negative uh, uh, consequences in terms of poverty and destitution. So, like we know, like that even in the UK, I think I was reading last week that uh, uh, three million people uh, are facing uh, uh, issues of uh, food insecurity because they cannot acquire food. Like so, this is very serious. So, so like uh, for me, the universal basic income is. Uh, um, I'm thinking of this in uh, that uh, uh, in those terms, uh, but I do agree that the universal basic income per se does not uh, address uh, uh, gender inequality um, and uh, like it might have under certain circumstances um, uh, the sort of negative implication of even exacerbating certain forms of uh, gender inequality but I I don't think like uh, that what we need is uh, UBI universal basic income only I think that uh, uh, we need uh, universal basic income and other forms of income replacement uh, in combination with uh, uh, working towards uh, uh, developing uh, universal basic services, uh, which is about ensuring that uh, everybody has access uh, to healthcare, to education, uh, and to social services and basic infrastructure. And I think uh, that uh, that system has the potential to um uh, address uh, certain forms of uh, gender inequality by alleviating the burden of uh, 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 care work uh, um, uh, placed upon women essentially and redistributing it uh, across uh, the society i just want to pick up on that because um i think naila kabir did mention about nationalizing um you know mm -hmm. Basic services. Um, is this something that would you know you see would happen going forward, given the lessons we learned um, from COVID nineteen? Yeah, I agree with Naila that uh, I think that uh, nationalizations are certainly something that uh, we need to think about, uh, and that I would like that to see happen. And uh, that was prior to this crisis, uh, and uh, even more so. So, like as it happened with many other things, I think this crisis is exposing um, a number of uh, uh, problems uh, with the ways in which we organize our economies and societies uh, that were already visible to some people before, and now, like uh, they are made uh, starkly visible to uh, many more people. And I think that uh, the nationalization of uh, certain uh, services uh, and certain industries uh, would uh, be desirable. This is one, <clears throat> excuse me, last, um, I don't know whether this sure. is any more questions. Okay, that's one question from Sarah Neufer. Um, from your perspective, how do you think progressive wealth taxes would be, um, you know, change um, inequalities in terms of class from feminist economy's perspective? Yeah, I think uh, I think that uh, uh, a wealth tax uh, like it would be highly appropriate. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, as I said, I think that we need to consider how different forms of uh, inequality interact and articulate and uh, 
think that uh, those forms of gender oppression and exploitation experienced by poorer uh, women and uh, poor people um, are indeed very central. And uh, in general, in order to give governments uh, uh, more resources uh, to uh, deal with the crisis and to think about uh, funding universal basic services and so forth, I think that uh, uh, progressive wealth taxes, like or even uh, uh, global wealth tax, like uh, would be highly appropriate. Okay, let's see. Um... We have about four more minutes. Um, I think there's there's sufficient time for one or two more questions, quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just to give a bit of time for people to just get their thought. Um, I was just wondering, in 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 your views, what do you think would be um, the role of the private sector in softening? the economic impact um, of what we, the, the recession that we're going to see, especially for uh, informal workers and, you know, a vulnerable group or vulnerable women. What do you think the for private sector can actually do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. So I think, uh, uh, I think we need to see like uh, where the private sector is, uh, like, you know, at the other end of this crisis, essentially. So, in a way, I think that, uh, let's say, I would worry that uh, if we want to, uh, if we expect the private sector to take up a very large role, I would worry that uh, now what uh, governments uh, are doing uh, would be directed uh, more towards the private sector and uh, less so towards the uh, uh, people, essentially. And I don't think that that is so desirable. So, and what we have seen in this crisis is really how much uh, the public sector can do and how much governments uh, can do. So I think that uh, at the moment I would focus more on that uh, rather than thinking about uh, what uh, the private sector can do uh, later on. And I think for informal workers in the global south, well, in some countries, uh, like I can see, like uh, that, so, like uh, the one, uh, um, the one big thing that many uh, so workers organizations uh, uh, and so forth are calling for are emergency uh, cash grants, and uh, and I think uh, that that is uh, what we need to focus on at the moment. Okay. Um... Okay, there's one that just came in. Um, whether you think parental leaves um, or paternity leave could help channeling a cultural and economic change towards um, evaluating or re-evaluating um, care? Yes, I think uh, parental leave policies are incredibly important. Uh, but then again, like so thinking about uh, the variety of uh, uh, workers uh, and livelihoods uh, from a global perspective, like uh, we need to see like uh, whether these parental leave policies, uh, for example, could be applied somehow to informal workers, uh, which at the moment uh, is not uh, really a possibility for us. Um, and so, you know, of course, like, uh, let's work on this, absolutely, but let's also remember, like, uh, what uh, we need to put in place uh, for those workers uh, that uh, are not covered uh, by provisions uh, such as uh, parental leave. I think that was the last of our question, and yeah, we okay. have, like, one, one minute um, left. Yeah. Um, I would like to... Um, well, okay, that's one question. I think, um, I don't know, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Sarah, if you want to answer this. Um, whether uh -huh. if you, we, we have seen more authoritarian government like China um, that has been more successful in containing um, the issue rather than countries in the West. Um, uh -huh. Do you anticipate a shift towards authori authoritarian um, form of government? I, I think I'll take this as a final question. Um, yes. Uh, respond to this yes it's a big question and i'm not an expert like on uh, on uh, authoritarianism but like i can just uh, uh, share like a very quick thought which is that yes i think this is a risk and uh, it is something that we need to 
keep our eyes on. Uh, but the, in, in a way, though, like, I think that uh, um, the power of the state uh, to address particularly the, I mean, both crises, health and economic crisis, like, is very important. So, like, in a way, uh, it's a delicate balance that we need to strike. Uh, but this is also why I think that those forms of community and grassroots level organizing are so important, because I would not uh, uh, simply say that, you know, or simply expect uh, that uh, uh, governments and states uh, should do everything. I think like uh, we need to take uh, up some issues in our hands. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Sarah for clear and stimulating um, discussions that we have this afternoon. And we hope that this webinar has been useful um, to all of you. And just for everybody's information, this, is, this recording will be up on Open Economic Forum Facebook, um, as well as uh, SOAS Economics Podcast. So um, we'll have another session next week on um, COVID-19 and the economic development in, America, in Latin America. So don't forget to join us. And I am going to put up um, the slides to share resources for information just for one minute so everybody can see it. Uh, but with that, I think um, that's it. And thank you, everyone, for your time and joining us today. Thank you so much, Latifa. Great moderation. And thanks so much to all of you for having joined us. We have like a fantastic lineup of uh, webinars uh, coming up. So do check like the new talks that are coming up in the next weeks okay all right thank you everyone thank you